Indonesia AirAsia Flight 8501 was a scheduled international passenger flight operated by Indonesia AirAsia, an AirAsia Group affiliate, from Surabaya, Indonesia, to Singapore. On 28 December 2014, the Airbus A320 flying the route crashed into the Java Sea, killing all 162 people on board. After search operations ended in March 2015, only 106 bodies were recovered. In December 2015, the Indonesian National Transportation Safety Committee (KNKT or NTSC) released a report concluding that a non-critical malfunction in the rudder control system prompted the captain to perform a non-standard reset of the onboard flight control computers. Control of the aircraft was subsequently lost, resulting in a stall and uncontrolled descent into the sea. Miscommunication between the two pilots was cited as a contributing factor. History of the flight Flight 8501 was a scheduled flight from Surabaya, Java, Indonesia to Singapore on Sunday, 28 December 2014. It was scheduled to depart Wanda International Airport at 5.20 Western Indonesian Time and arrive at Singapore Chani Airport at 8.30 Singapore Standard Time Flight 8501 took off at 5.35. Indonesia AirAsia did not have permission from the Indonesian Ministry of Transportation to operate the route on Sundays. After departure, Flight 8501 was in contact with the Jakarta Area Control Center, call sign Jakarta Center, which provides air traffic control ATC service over the western Java Sea, and flying along Air Route M635, when it approached a line of thunderstorms off the southwest coast of Borneo. At 6.12, Flight 8501 was flying at flight level 320, approximately 32,000 feet 9,750 meters, when the cockpit requested and received permission to deviate left from its original flight path to avoid these storms. The pilot then requested to climb to flight level 380, which was deferred by ATC because of other aircraft in the vicinity. AirNav Indonesia, which operates the Jakarta Area Control Center, reported that Jakarta Center then cleared Flight 8501 to flight level 340 at 614, but no response was received. Other aircraft in the vicinity were asked to contact Flight 8501, but also did not receive a response. Between 6 hours 17 minutes and 0 seconds and 6 hours 17 minutes and 54 seconds, the aircraft climbed from 32,000 to 37,000 feet 9,800 to 11,300 meters, exceeding a climb rate of 10,000 feet per minute. The flight data recorder FDR showed the aircraft at 35,500 feet 10,800 meters — and still climbing at 159 knots, 294 kilometers per hour, 183 miles per hour, which is below the stall speed for the airplane's weight at that altitude. The Indonesian Minister of Transport interpreted the apparent aircraft behavior at peak altitude as an aerodynamic stall. When it began to descend at 6 hours 17 minutes and 54 seconds, descending 1,000 feet 300 meters within 6 seconds and 8,000 feet 2,400 meters within 31 seconds. The aircraft also began a turn to the left, forming at least one complete circle before disappearing from radar at 6 hours 18 minutes and 44 seconds. 
Its last recorded position was over the Java Sea, Karamata Strait between the islands of Bleetung and Kalimantan, 3.3708 degrees south, 109.6911 degrees east, minus 3.3708, 109.6911. AirAsia Flight 8501 last transponder signal. The aircraft crashed in the Java Sea, Karamata Strait between the islands of Bleetung and Borneo, 3.623 degrees south, 109.712 degrees east, minus 3.623, 109.712 AirAsia Flight 8501 crash site. The cockpit voice recorder captured multiple warnings, including a stall warning, sounding in the cockpit during the final minutes of the flight. No distress signal was sent from the aircraft. Search and Rescue SAR operations were activated by the Indonesia National Search and Rescue Agency Basarnas from the Pangkal Penang office. Topic. Aircraft The aircraft was an Airbus A320-216, with serial number 3648, registered as PKAXC. It first flew on 25 September 2008, and was delivered to AirAsia on 15 October 2008. The aircraft was six years old and had accumulated approximately 23,000 flight hours over 13,600 flights. It had undergone its most recent scheduled maintenance on 16 November 2014. The aircraft was powered by two CFM International CFM 56-5 B6 engines and was configured to carry 180 passengers. Topic. Victims AirAsia released details of the 155 passengers which included 137 adults, 17 children, and one infant. The crew consisted of two pilots and four flight attendants. A company engineer was also on board and was not counted as one of the passengers. The pilots on board the flight were Captain Irianto, age 53, an Indonesian national, had a total of 20,537 flying hours, of which 6,100 were with Indonesia AirAsia on the Airbus A320. The captain began his career with the Indonesian Air Force, graduating from pilot school in 1983 and flying jet fighter aircraft. He took early retirement from the Air Force in the mid-1990s to join Adam Air, and later worked for Merpati Nusantara Airlines and Sriwijaya Air before joining Indonesia AirAsia. First Officer Remy Emmanuel Plessel, age 46, a French national, had a total of 2,247 flying hours. He was originally from Le Marigot, Martinique, and had studied and worked in Paris. He was living in Indonesia. Forty-one people who were on board the AirAsia flight were members of a single church congregation in Surabaya. Most were families with young children traveling to Singapore for a New Year's holiday. The bodies began to be returned to their families on 1 January 2015. At that time, the East Java Regional Police Department's Disaster Victim Identification Commissioner stated that the victims were identified by the means of post-mortem results, thumb prints, and their personal belongings. <laughs> Search and recovery Shortly after the aircraft was confirmed to be missing, unconfirmed reports stated that wreckage had been found off the island of Bleetung in Indonesia. 
Indonesia's National Search and Rescue Agency Basarnas, deployed seven ships and two helicopters to search the shores of Blitung and Kalimantan. The Indonesian Navy and the Provincial Indonesian National Police Air and Water Unit each sent out search and rescue teams. In addition, an Indonesian Air Force Boeing 737 reconnaissance aircraft was dispatched to the last known location of the airliner. The Indonesian Navy dispatched four ships by the end of the first search day, and the Air Force deployed aircraft including a CASA IPTN CN 235. The Indonesian Army deployed ground troops to search the shores and mountains of adjacent islands. Local fishermen also participated in the search. Ongoing search and rescue operations were under the guidance of the Civil Aviation Authority of Indonesia. The search was suspended at 7.45 p.m. local time on 28 December due to darkness and bad weather, to be resumed in daylight. An operations center to coordinate search efforts was set up in Pangkal Penang. The search area was a 270 nautical mile 500 kilometers radius near Blitung Island. Search and rescue operations quickly became an international effort. By 30 December naval and air units from Singapore, Malaysia and Australia had joined Indonesian authorities in patrolling designated search areas. Singapore's Rescue Coordination Centre RCC deployed three C-130 Hercules aircraft to aid in the search and rescue operation. A formidable class frigate, a Victory class corvette, a landing ship tank, and a submarine support and rescue vessel subsequently took part in the search and rescue after Indonesia's National Search and Rescue Agency accepted the offer of help from the Republic of Singapore Navy. Singapore's Ministry of Transport provided specialist teams from the Air Accident and Investigation Bureau and underwater locator equipment. The Malaysian government set up a rescue coordination centre at Subang and deployed three military vessels and three aircraft, including a C-130, to assist in search and rescue operations. Australia deployed a P-3 Orion to assist in the search and rescue operation. Elements of the United States Navy joined the search effort. USS Sampson arrived on station late on the 30th of December, and USS Fort Worth on the 3rd of January. By the 5th of January, 31 bodies had been recovered with the aid of the Russian and the U.S. search teams. Divers entered the main section of the fuselage underwater and discovered six bodies on 24 January. More than 90 vessels and aircraft from Indonesia, Singapore, Malaysia, Australia, South Korea, Japan, China, the United States, and Russia participated in the search. This fleet included three ships with underwater detectors and two fuel tankers seconded to ensure efficient operation of the vessels in the search area. On 2 January the Indonesian Ministry of Transport reported that two other Indonesian tender vessels had been fitted with equipment which could detect acoustic signals from the flight recorder. Black box beacons and airframe metal, as well as multibeam side-scan sonar. The official search for bodies ended on 17 March, after 106 bodies had been recovered. 56 bodies remained unaccounted for, a live Reddit feed that was constantly updating the details of the search and recovery efforts, leaked details of the operation. An April press conference revealed details discovered by the Basarna's rescue team divers. 115 remains including body parts were recovered. 111 of them are believed to be from 99 passengers. Wreckage <inaudible> 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 On the day of the disappearance, a fisherman observed, 
a lot of debris, small and large, near Pulau Tuju. It looked like the Air Asia colors. Another fisherman reported that, while moored on Sunday at Pulau Sengora, south of the town of Pankalan Bun in central Kalimantan, around 7 a.m., I heard a loud booming sound. Soon afterwards, there was haze that usually happened only during the dry season. Before the exploding sound, my friends saw a plane from above Pulau Sengaro heading towards the sea. The plane was said to be flying relatively low, but then disappeared. The fishermen's reports, delivered after they had returned home the next day, were credited with guiding the search and rescue team to the vicinity of the crash. The first items of wreckage were spotted by search aircraft on 30 December in the Karamata Strait, 10 kilometres from where the crew last contacted air traffic control, and three bodies were recovered by the warship KRI Bung Tomo. On 31 December, Basarnas claimed that a sonar image obtained 30 December by an Indonesian naval ship appeared to show an aircraft up upside down on the seabed in about 24 to 30 meters 80 to 100 feet of water about 3.2 to 3.5 kilometers 2.0 to 2.2 miles from the debris found on the 30th of December the head of the search and rescue agency also denied the existence of any sonar images of the wreckage as well as the reported recovery of a body wearing a life vest he stressed that only official information from his search and rescue service can be considered to be reliable. On 2 January 2015, Basarnas reported evidence of a fuel slick on the water surface in the search area, but detection of the fuselage remained unconfirmed. At a press conference given on the morning of 3 January by Basarnas, the discovery of two large submerged objects was reported 9.4 m x 4.8 m x 0.4 m, 30.8 feet x 15.7 feet times 1.3 feet, and a thin object 7.2 meters times 0.5 meters, 23.6 feet times 1.6 feet. Also, the previously reported fuel slick was confirmed. A later media report mentioned four large sections of wreckage, the largest being 18 meters times 5.4 meters times 2.2 meters, 59.1 feet times 17.7 feet times 7.2 feet, located at 3.9242 degrees south, 110.5252 degrees east, minus 3.9242, 110. 0.5252 AirAsia Flight 8501 first wreckage. Later in the day, Basarnas announced no more bodies were found, leaving the total at 30. On the 7th of January, divers found parts of the aircraft, including a section of the tail. Other sections of the tail are expected to lie nearby. On 10 January divers used an inflatable device to bring the aircraft's tail to the surface of the sea. They continued to search the sea floor within 500 meters 1,600 feet of where faint pings were heard. The flight data recorder was recovered by Indonesian divers on 12 January at 3.6225 degrees south 109.7117 degrees east, minus 3.6225, 109.7117 AirAsia Flight 85 501 FDR salvage within 4 kilometers 2.5 miles of part of the fuselage and tail later in the day the cockpit voice recorder was located and was recovered the following day on the 14th of January the Republic of Singapore Navy submarine rescue vessel Swift Rescue located a large section of the fuselage with one wing attached 
On 25 January, ropes around the fuselage snapped during an initial failed effort to raise the wreckage. Four bodies were recovered, taking the total recovered to 69. More bodies were thought to be inside. Rear Admiral Widodo, who is in charge of recovery operations, said that the fuselage might be too fragile to be lifted. On the 27th of February, salvage workers recovered a large piece of fuselage, including the wings of the A320. Lifting balloons were used to lift the fuselage, but the first attempt failed as the balloons deflated. By March 2015, all large pieces of fuselage from the jet had been lifted from the seafloor and moved for investigative purposes. <laughs> Aftermath AirAsia An emergency call center was established by the airline for the families of those who were on board the aircraft, and an emergency information center was set up at Wanda International Airport to provide hourly updates as well as lodging for victims' relatives. Smaller posts were also opened at Sokarno Hatta International Airport and Sultan Hassanuddin International Airport. On 31 December 2014, Indonesia AirAsia retired the flight number QZ8501, changing the designation of its Surabaya Singapore route to QZ678. The return flight number was also changed, from QZ8502 to QZ679, subsequent to the 1 December 2015 NTSC report as to the causes of the crash, the airline said it had already implemented improved pilot training. <laughs> Airbus. Immediately after the NTSC report on the crash was released on 1 December 2015, the manufacturer of the A320 aircraft was not ready to provide a comment, stating in an email that Airbus has just received the final accident report. We are now carefully studying its content. Indonesia. AirAsia did not have any official permission to fly the Surabaya-Singapore route on Sunday, the day of the crash, but was licensed on four other days of the week, and, according to an Indonesian Ministry of Transport statement, "...the Indonesian authorities are suspending the company's flights on this route with immediate effect pending an investigation." In response on the same day, the Civil Aviation Authority of Singapore CAAS and the Chani Airport Group CAG made a clarification that AirAsia QZ8501 has been given approval at Singapore's end to operate a daily flight for the northern winter season from the 26th of October 2014 to the 28th of March 2015. On 6 January 2015, Indonesian Ministry of Transport representative Joka Merjatmojo stated that, "...officials at the airport operator in Surabaya and the Air Traffic Control Agency who had allowed the flight to take off had been moved to other duties," and an immediate air transport directive had been issued making it mandatory for pilots to go through a face-to-face -face briefing by an airline flight operations officer on weather conditions and other operational issues prior to every flight." The loss of Flight 8501 also brought attention to the lack of weather radar at Indonesian air traffic control centers. According to the Toronto Star, Indonesia's aviation industry has been plagued with problems 
Pilot shortages, shoddy maintenance and poor oversight have all been blamed following a string of deadly accidents in recent years. The West Kotawaringan administration in Pankalan Bun, central Kalimantan, planned to build a memorial for the AirAsia flight which also doubles as a monument for aviation safety. Central Kalimantan Deputy Governor Ahmed Duran also stated that the monument is also going to be the symbol of gratitude and appreciation for the efforts of the National Search and Rescue Agency. The cornerstone ceremony took place on Wednesday, and was attended by local and state officials and representatives from Australia and Singapore. West Kotawaringan Regent Ujang Iskander stated that with this monument, we hope that the families and the government will lay flowers every 28 December, and continue the dialogue on aviation safety in Indonesia." On the 22nd of March, there was a gathering of people near the site of the crash and the crowd laid flowers around. Family members of crew members and passengers Air Asia has reportedly offered US$32,000 or RP300 million to each of the grieving family members of the victims of the accident as initial compensation from an overall part of compensation. Wall Street Journal claimed from a letter on Air Asia stationery dated the 2nd of January, grieving family member David Thejakusuma received, who had 7 family members on the flight, the amount for for each family member he lost on the 16th of March 2015 Monash University awarded in the form of posthumous title award of posthumous degree the bachelor of commerce to one of the late crash victims Kevin Alexander Sujipto Professor Colm Carney dean of the faculty of business and economics presented it to a member of his family a memorial service was held alongside the presentation of the award, and was attended by the Consul General of Indonesia for Victoria and Tasmania, Dewey Savitri Wahab, 40 of the deceased's friends and representatives from the Indonesian Student Association in Australia PPIA Monash University branch. On 28 December 2015, the first anniversary of the crash, a private prayer service was held held in a private room in Mahamaru Building, East Java Regional Police, Surabaya, and was attended by family members and relatives of the victims of the crash. The service was also attended by the head chief of the Search and Rescue Agency Henry Bombang Solistio. Representatives from the family members asked the National Transportation Safety Committee to ensure the safety of air travel in Indonesia. The Indonesian government was also asked by the family members to ratify the Montreal Convention, finally ratified on 19 May 2017. <laughs> Legal proceedings France opened a criminal investigation to investigate possible manslaughter charges. The family of the first officer, a French national, have filed a lawsuit against AirAsia in connection to the lack of permission to fly on that day, claiming the airline was "...endangering the life of others." Surabaya Mayor Tri Rizmaharini says her administration is ready to sue AirAsia should it ignore the rights of the families of passengers on flight QZ8501, following the suspension of the airline's flight permit from the East Java city to Singapore. Rizma said her administration had also consulted with legal experts from Erlanga University on the fears of most families regarding the difficulties in disbursing insurance funds. After the Transportation Ministry regarded the Surabaya Singapore flight on December 28 as illegitimate, she said her administration continued to collect data on the victims, including their valuable belongings. 
The data would later be used for insurance purposes and matters related to the beneficiary rights of the affected families. A U.S. based aviation lawyer was planning to sue AirAsia, claiming that they are representing ten families over an aircraft malfunction following the crash of Flight QZ8501. Principal of Chicago-based Wisner law firm Floyd Wisner said that although preliminary investigations found that weather was a factor, the Airbus A320-200 suffered a malfunction of the fly-by-wire system. According to the statement, the lawsuit, which was filed in the U.S. state of Illinois, states that at the time the accident aircraft left the control of defendant Airbus, it was defectively and unreasonably dangerous, and names Honeywell International, Motorola Inc. and other suppliers along with Airbus as defendants. The case was Aris Siswanto et al. v. Airbus, SAS et al. 115 CV 0548. U.S. District Court, Northern District of Illinois Chicago. On 30 June 2015, the suit had still named only Airbus and its suppliers but AirAsia was to be added as a defendant, according to Floyd Wisner of the Wisner Law Firm. However on 9 December 2016, the case was dismissed and the lawsuit was dropped. Air transport industry Following the recovery of the flight recorders, on 12 and 13 January, an anonymous international civil aviation organization representative said, "...the time has come that deployable recorders are going to get a serious look." Unlike military recorders, which jettison away from an aircraft and float on the water, signaling their location to search and rescue bodies, recorders on commercial aircraft sink. A second ICAO official said that public attention had "...galvanized momentum in favor of ejectable recorders on commercial aircraft." Topic. Indonesian tourism Indonesia's tourism was badly affected by the accident. According to the head of Indonesia's Central Statistics Agency CSA, Suriaman in a press conference at his office on 1 April 2015, the accident caused the number of foreign visitors to decline. Figures from the Indonesian Ministry of Tourism showed that the number of incoming foreign tourists at Surabaya's Wanda Airport declined by 5.33%, Jakarta's Sokarno Hatta International Airport by 15.01%, and Bandung's Hussein Sastranagara Airport by 10.66%. Investigation The events leading to the crash were investigated by Indonesia's National Transportation Safety Committee KNKT or NTSC. Assistance was provided by Australia, France, Singapore, and Malaysia. Data from the flight data recorder were downloaded. 124 minutes of cockpit dialogue was successfully extracted from the cockpit voice recorder. The sound of many alarms from the flight system can be heard in the final minutes, almost drowning out the voices of the pilots. The investigators ruled out a terrorist attack as the cause and then examined the possibility of human error or aircraft malfunction. The aircraft altitude recorded by ATC radar increased from 32,000 to 37,000 feet (9,750 to 11,300 meters) between 6 hours 17 minutes and 0 seconds and 6 hours 17 minutes and 54 seconds WIB at an initial rate of up to 6,000 feet per minute (1,830 meters per minute). 
At 6 hours 17 minutes and 54 seconds, the aircraft descended from 37,000 to 36,000 feet 11,300 to 11,000 meters in 6 seconds, and from 36,000 to 29,000 feet 11,000 to 8,840 meters in 25 seconds, although the aircraft's route took it through areas of cloud that extended from 12,000 feet 3,700 meters up to 44,000 feet 13,000 meters FDR data showed that weather was not a factor in the accident acting director of air transportation Joka Merjatmajo clearly stated that the investigation of the flight route and the investigation of the crash itself are separate Merjatmajo said that AirAsia is clearly wrong because they didn't fly at a time and schedule that was already determined. Both Singapore's Civil Aviation Authority and the Chani Airport Group stated that AirAsia was allowed daily flights between Surabaya and Singapore. Tatong Kurniadi, head of Indonesia's National Transportation Safety Committee, stated that sabotage was ruled out as a cause of the accident by the black boxes, and a preliminary report was supposedly submitted to the International Civil Aviation Organization by early February. <laughs> Final NTSC report After studying the wreckage of the Airbus A320-216 as well as the two black boxes and the cockpit recorder, Indonesia's National Transportation Safety Committee issued a report with their conclusions from the investigation on 1 December 2015. The report stated that the sequence of events that led to the crash started with a malfunction in two of the plane's rudder travel limiter units RTLU. A tiny soldered electrical connection in the plane's RTLU was found to be cracked, likely for over a year, causing it to intermittently send Amber Master Caution warnings to the Electronic Centralized Aircraft Monitor ECAM. With the plane's maintenance records showing that the RTLU warning had been sent 23 times over the previous year, but was always solved and never further investigated, which could have addressed the underlying electrical problem by resetting the RTLU system. On this flight, the RTLU issue sent an amber caution warning four different times, and the first three times that the ECAM system gave the warning. Auto Flight Rudder Travel Limiter System. The pilot in command followed the ECAM instructions, toggling the flight augmentation computer FAC 1 and 2 buttons on the cockpit's overhead panel to off and then on. This procedure did clear the Amber Master caution warnings for each of those first three warnings. Specifics in the report indicate that French First Officer Remy Emmanuel Plessel was at the controls just before the stall warning sounded in the cockpit, indicating that the jet had lost lift. Investigators also found that, just moments earlier on the fourth occurrence of the RTLU warning during the flight, the captain chose to ignore the procedure advised by the ECAM instructions, and, instead, left his seat and reset the circuit breaker of the entire FAC, unintentionally disengaging multiple flight control systems, which would have to be turned on by the pilots after the circuit breakers are reset. This circuit breaker is not on the list of circuit breakers that are allowed to be reset in flight, and disabling both facts placed the aircraft in alternate law mode, disengaging the autopilot and stopping the automatic stall protection and bank angle protection. The FAC is the part of the fly-by-wire system in A320 aircraft responsible for controlling flight surfaces including the rudder. Without the FAC's computerized flight augmentation, pilots would have to rely on manual flying skills that are often stretched during a sudden airborne emergency. 
When the crew was required to fly the Airbus A320 manually, there was an unexplained nine-second delay between the start of the roll and either pilot attempting to take control. After nine seconds, the aircraft was banking at a 54 degrees angle. The report did not specifically conclude that pilot error caused the crash while detailing the chain of events leading to the loss of Flight 8501. However, one of the investigators, the NTSC's Nurjayo Yutomo, referred to an apparent miscommunication between the pilots based on the recordings on the cockpit voice recorder and said that the malfunction should not have led to a total loss of control had they followed the recommended procedure. Topic: <laughs> Side stick control issue. The example of miscommunication between the pilots was when the plane was in a critical stalling condition, the copilot misunderstood the captain's command, pull down, instead of pushing the airplane's nose down, pushing forward on the stick to regain speed and escape the stall, he pulled the stick back, which would have ordered the plane to climb more steeply. Because the captain was also pushing the stick forward and because Airbus has a dual input system, the two stick inputs cancelled each other out, which led to the plane remaining in a stall condition until the end of the black box recording. See the similar side stick control issue in the Air France Flight 447 accident. On 3 December 2015, Indonesia's Air Transportation Director General, Supraseto, said that the National Safety Transportation Board KNKT, had provided recommendations as to tightened controls on aircraft maintenance and flight crew competence. He added that the government had implemented a series of corrective actions as a preventive measure so that the same accident will not happen again in the future." Supraseto also confirmed that the suspension of Indonesia AirAsia's Surabaya-Singapore route would not be lifted until the carrier had completed the steps recommended by the KNKT. The report stated that the crash resulted from the flight crew's inability to control the aircraft in alternate law. The cracking of a solder joint resulted in the failure of the rudder travel limiter unit four times during the flight. The flight crew action to the first three faults was in accordance with the electronic centralized aircraft monitor messages. Following the fourth fault, the flight augmentation computer's circuit breakers were reset by the flight crew, resulting in electrical interruption to the computers causing the autopilot to disengage and the flight control logic to change to alternate law. The rudder deflected two degrees to the left, causing the aircraft to roll up to 54 degrees. Subsequent flight crew actions resulted in the aircraft entering a prolonged stall from which they were unable to recover. <laughs> <laughs> Dramatization The crash was dramatized in the 16th season of the TV series Mayday, in an episode entitled, Deadly Solution. Aired just over two years after the crash in early February 2017. Topic. See also. Air France Flight 447 and Airbus A330 that suffered similar high altitude stall problems. Accidents and incidents involving the Airbus A320 family List of aircraft accidents and incidents resulting in at least 50 fatalities <laughs> Notes <laughs>